Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar in our Monarch Butterfly Conservation webinar series. My name is Tracy McLeaf. I'm a biologist here at the National Conservation Training Center with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And we, I'm going to introduce you to Wendy Caldwell, who is the program coordinator for the Monarch Joint Venture, to introduce today's speaker and presentation. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us. As Tracy mentioned, I'm Wendy Caldwell, the coordinator of the Monarch Joint Venture, and I'm also joined by Cora on our staff team, who is the communications specialist. We're excited to bring you today's webinar, Growing Milkweed for Monarch Conservation, with presenter Chip Taylor from Monarch Watch. Chip has a broad background in insect ecology. Starting in 1974, he established research sites and directed students studying neotropical African honeybees in French Guiana, Venezuela, and Mexico. In 1992, he founded Monarch Watch, an outreach program focused on education, research, and conservation relative to monarch butterflies. Since then, the program has enlisted the help of volunteers to tag monarchs during the fall migration, a pro program which has yielded many new insights into the dynamics of monarch migration. In 2005, Monarch Watch created their Monarch Way Station program in recognition that habitat for monarchs is declining at a rate of 6,000 acres per day in the U.S. The goal of this program is to inspire the public, schools, and others to create habitat for monarch butterflies and to assist Monarch Watch in educating the public about the decline in resources for monarchs, pollinators, and wildlife that share the same habitat. So with that, if any questions come up during Chip's presentation, Cora and I will be monitoring the chat box on live stream where I see a number of you are chatting already. Um, so we encourage you to ask your questions there throughout the presentation, and then we will come back to a question and answer period at the end where I'll ask some of your questions of Chip. Um, so with that, Chip, I will let you take it from here. Well, thank you very much, Wendy. Here's our logo for uh, Monarch Watch. Uh, you can see we represent the earth and the green and the sky with uh, monarch colors. Um, we had a hard time making coming up with this logo, but it served us very well. Anyway, uh, Monarch Watch has been in operation, as Wendy told us, since 1992. And we started out as, a, as an educational program, mostly with some focus on research. But since about 2005, almost everything that we have really focused on has had something to do with monarch conservation. So we're going to talk about propagating milkweeds today, because this is something that I've really gotten into. Well, I've been into it for about 10 years, but uh, really got into it about four years ago. And we'll go through that. And we'll go through some of the things that I've learned. Hopefully, this will help you. Uh, grow some milkweeds on your own. All right, as you know why we're here and why we're concerned about getting milkweeds out there is the monarch population is way down. You can see that over here on the, on the right, uh, in 2014, the winter of, uh, we had a population of only 0.67 hectares, a very small population, the smallest we'd ever seen. Uh, this created a lot of concern about monarch butterflies and it inspired uh, the president uh, to get together all the monarch folks as well as pollinator folks at that time. And the president issued a memorandum on the 20th of June uh, 2014, um, getting all the federal agencies involved in trying to understand what was happening with monarch butterflies and what was, understand what was happening with pollinators and to try to do something about it. And a number of us have been very active um, with federal agencies trying to come up with solutions, and one of the solutions, of course, is to get a lot more milkweed back on the habitat. Now, you'll see that the population has increased each of the last two years. The reason for that has been more favorable uh, breeding conditions. Uh, we hope that these more favorable conditions will uh, take place again this year. Uh, it looks good in the future if long-range forecasts can be trusted. On the other hand, we've had uh, a lot of mortality at the overwintering sites at the very end of winter and we're not sure how many monarchs are coming north right now. Uh, so it, kind of all bets are off in terms of what we can expect next year. But it will, I think I can say with some certainty, it will not be four hectares. It will be much less than that next year, uh, no matter how good the season is, because we lost so much in this last winter storm down there. Uh, in any case, we need to do something about the habitat. The habitat losses have been a subject of a lot of discussion, and there's a lot of reasons behind the habitat loss thing. We don't need to go into that now. The fact is that we need to make up for this habitat loss, 
and we need to recognize that we're losing about a million acres a year in this country due to development, uh, due to uh, changes in landscape management, uh, and uh, that, at the very least, we have to compensate for that million acres a year. And to do that, we have to get some uh, restoration going. And uh, to accomplish that, we have to learn how to grow milkweeds, we have to learn how to grow all of the native flowering plants that are, the butterflies need, and so on and so forth. So massive restoration is in order. Uh, the bottom line of all of the analyses are that we have to restore about 1.4 billion stems of milkweed out there in the habitat. In addition, we are probably talking about a restoration out of 20 million acres or more. So that's the task we are faced with. And, but first of all, we've got to come up to come up with solutions to that 1 million acres a year, and we're not we're not there yet. But we're working on it. And let's talk about how we can do that better. All right. As Wendy told you, we created a monarch waste station program in 2005. I realized that habitat was declining at that time. We started that program uh, in 05, but it took place or took off very slowly. We now have almost 13,000 monarch waste stations, and you can see that these are concentrated around cities, developed areas. Uh, we're not getting out in the country as much as we would like, uh, so we've we've really got to enlarge this program. 12,000, 13,000. Uh, registered monarch waste stations and double or triple that, that in terms of what's already been created that we know about. Um, that's good. It's a good start, but we probably need about 10 or 12 million of them to really have an impact on the monarch population. So we're a long way away from where we want to be. All right. Realizing that the monarch waste station program wasn't going to cut it entirely, I started to bring back the monarchs program, which is really a restoration habitat program. Uh, and I started this in 2010. Uh, this has been slow to take off, but it's really moving along pretty fast right now. Now, to facilitate all of this, we created what we call the Monarch Watch uh, Milkweed Market, and you can go to our website uh, at monarchwatch.org and take a look at what we offer on that uh, website in terms of, of milkweeds. But this will give you an idea of what we've been doing over the last uh, three years. Uh, I started talking to nurseries about producing milkweed plugs because I thought that was going to be unnecessary. Uh, implement here to try to um, get things going, and it turned out the nurseries would just tell me, well, uh, we don't see what the market is and we don't want to invest in it. So I finally encouraged uh, one of my local nurserymen here, Elliot Demler from Applied Ecological Services, uh, to grow 25,000 milkweeds for us in 2013. Uh, Elliot did, and he did a terrific job. And using social media and so on, we were able to distribute something like 22,000 of those and overwintered many of the rest. In 2014, we increased it to 59,000, and last year it was 109,000. And this year, working with five nurseries now, we're expecting to distribute over 200,000 milkweed plugs. And these are plugs that are distributed back to areas where uh, the, uh, the seeds come from. All right. Now, if you, you folks are going to get involved in this, uh, you're going to have to do some fundamentals here. Uh, to create the milkweed plugs that you need for restoration. And we're going to start with collecting seeds. So the first thing you need to do is locate patches of milkweeds, and you need to monitor those milkweed populations and kind of protect them if you possibly can from mowing or what other insults might happen to them. Uh, and you want to harvest when the pods are able to split while you're pressing on the seam of the pod. If you take your thumb and press it on the seam of the pod, if it splits, opens and you see some browning seeds inside, you're ready to collect the pod. If you want more detail on how to do all of this, we have some details on uh, collecting and, and processing uh, seeds on our uh, website, monarchwatch.org. You can just go to the Bring Back the Monarchs program and you look at the uh, milkweed seed collecting and processing section of that uh, part of the website, and then you'll get a lot more detail than I have time to give you here. But that will help you out in case you forget any of this. All right, this looks good, doesn't it? A lot of milkweeds out there. They've lost most of their leaves late in the, late in the season. This is probably uh, late August, early September. And you'd say, well, those are ready to pick, right? No, not ready. They're not ready to harvest. Now they're ready to harvest. You see them in this stage uh, when they haven't split yet, but they're, they're like this. They're, they've grayed up quite a bit. Now you can harvest them. And when you harvest them, the seeds inside will look like this. But this is what you don't want to harvest. You don't want to harvest seed pods that have split like this 
for the rare, very reason of that little uh, bug that you see up there at the top right. That's a large milkweed bug, Oncopelphus um, fasciatus, and that's a, a migratory insect that comes in here, feeds on the flesh of the milkweed pods, but also feeds on the seeds. And once they start puncturing the seeds, those seeds are no longer viable. So you don't want to use something like this. It's open. Uh, you just leave it out there. The seeds that survive will be the seeds that can start new plants, but you don't want to take a lot of uh, seeds back with you that are no longer going to be viable. I advise you to take some onion bags or something coarse like this out there with you when you're collecting pods. You want those pods to breathe. Uh, you don't want them to mildew. Uh, you want to collect them in open sacks like this. Paper sacks are fine, but uh, very often they're not uh, breathing enough unless you leave the tops of them open. And even then, if you've got kind of sweaty milkweed pods, they can mildew up quite a bit and, and affect the seeds. In any case, you collect the pods, throw them in these bags, take these bags, you can hang them up, or you can spread out the seeds like this, spread out the pods like that, and wait for the pods to split like this. Once the pods have split, uh, then you're ready to uh, strip the, the coma or fluff and seeds out of the, uh, out of the pod itself and process them uh, that way. Now, uh, there are some processing ways in which leave all the seed pod in there but I prefer to strip the, the seeds out and the fluff out and uh, put them into a uh, processing system that uh, separates the seeds from the fluff. In any case, whatever you do, whatever you harvest, the seeds must be brown or browning up. Now this is a very similar milkweed to the common milkweed which I've been showing you so far. This is something called Sullivan's milkweed. Uh, you'll notice that it doesn't have that fluting along the pod and the pod is quite a bit darker. Uh, it's actually quite a bit harder. Uh, this plant actually looks so much like common milkweed that many people uh, confuse it with common milkweed, but you can see that the milkweed bugs have already assembled, and you can see the pods beginning to open, and they just can't wait for dinner to start here. They're all coming together there, and uh, they're going to enter that pod and, and uh, probably decimate all of those seeds as soon as it splits a little bit more. In any case, uh, these pods, just like the others, you have to collect them before the milkweed bugs get at them. And when you see this again, this is another Sullivan's milkweed. When you see it split like this, just leave it alone. Let it populate the, the area. There are usually enough pods to, uh, to still collect. One of the concerns that we run into about uh, collecting seeds of any of these native plants is that people say, well, don't don't over collect. Don't over collect. That, that's usually not a problem with milkweeds because they don't all mature at the same time. Uh, there's another consideration in that these are usually long-lived stands of plants. They're going to be producing uh, seeds next year and the year after and the year after and the year after that. Uh, many of these things have a very low uh, replacement rate. They produce a lot of seeds relative to the natural replacement. So uh, taking a few hundred or a few thousand pods out of an area. Uh, and one season usually is not a, a big problem. Uh, if you're dealing with something that's rare, that's another issue. If you're dealing with something that has only a very small population, that's another issue. But with things like uh, Sullivan's milkweed, common milkweed, swamp milkweed, uh, sometimes tuberosa, which is the butterfly weed, and uh, sometimes the green antelope horn milkweed, uh, those populations are usually so large that we don't have to worry about over-harvesting uh, the seeds. All right, there's tuberosa, and tuberosa is your butterfly weed, your typical orange flower plant. And when you see these rosy tips to these seed pods, you're getting close, but you're not there yet. You, you see that nice seam on the one at the lower left. You see the seam that I'm talking about uh, on the one in the lower left corner. You press on that, and you will still not see uh, brown seeds in there. So you have to wait about another week after they get like this before you can really harvest the seeds. This is green antelope horn milkweed, it's Plictus viridis. Uh, this one uh, in our area uh, starts uh, blooming in May, mid-May, although this year it'll be early because we are dealing with early season. Uh, you're going to have nice green ponds like this, and they stay green like this for almost a month, and then they begin to yellow, and when they yellow uh, and they split along the seam, then you get this nice perfusion of, of seeds here, nice layered in there umbricated, some people call that umbricated or layered or shingled seeds in there, and uh, this is uh, ready to harvest. And we often have to go out and 
look at these uh, places where this plant is growing two or three times before we can uh, actually start harvesting. Uh, this thing is really deceptive. How fast they determine uh, or how fast they mature uh, seems to vary from place to place and, and season to season, but it's usually mid-July by the time we're collecting these. Uh, this is swamp milkweed. As you probably haven't seen it, this is swamp milkweed growing in a real swamp. And uh, we have the swamp milkweed that grows here uh, is tall and rangy like this, a big candelabra-type plant. This plant was probably five or six feet tall. And you can see all of these nice erect seed pods. Uh, this is an interesting species from the standpoint that it seems to be one of the few that can self-fertilize. Uh, uh, most of the milkweeds need to have uh, pollen sources from unrelated plants. Uh, they are obligate outcrossers, in other words. This one is not an obligate outcrosser. It seems to have relatively low genetic variability, and uh, you can go in there and go into various populations, and we have, and it doesn't appear that they have a lot of genetic variability either within or among populations. In any case, this is still not ready to harvest. You have to wait a little bit longer. Uh, before these things begin to split. In this case, they begin to uh, turn a little bit uh, beigey in color, and uh, once they get a little bit beige in that, that beige sort of color, then you can harvest them. Now, this is something we have here in the Midwest that you're not going to see everywhere in the country, and this is something called Sinangium levy or honey vine. It's also called blue vine or sand vine. Uh, the monarchs use this plant and its heart-shaped leaves very late in the season. And here you see four pods uh, hanging among the vines, uh, and they're, they're maturing. This one, once you get to the point where uh, some of them be, uh, begin to take this color, uh, you can collect almost all of them because they, uh, whether they, the pods are still green or not, they are uh, definitely uh, uh, drying up and uh, filling out. And this, this is a nice collection I made a few years ago. This is not necessarily something you want to have in your garden, but it is an important plant for monarch butterflies uh, through much of the Midwest, uh, really from probably from Indiana and Ohio um, through Illinois, uh, down through uh, Kentucky and over here into uh, at least uh, central Kansas and maybe even a little further south. Um, it's, it's a good plant, as I said, but it's only good in the fall. All right, this is a curious one. I threw it in. I threw this one in here because you probably didn't have never seen this one, and very few of you will. This is a milkweed that occurs along the Louisiana and Gulf Coast, uh, all the way over into Florida. This is Asclepias perennis. It's called the aquatic milkweed. It has some interesting habits to it. Uh, first of all, it's the only milkweed I have ever grown or ever seen that actually drop its, drops its pods. If you're familiar with other milkweeds, like common milkweeds or any of the others that normally occur in the Northeast or most of the country, they don't drop their pods. The pods stay on the plant uh, for the life of the, the, the stalk, and then the stalk falls uh, down or something. In any case, these drop their pods, and the pods float away because this is living in aquatic environments, more or less, or flooded environments. Uh, and the pods then some uh, open, and uh, as you might expect in an aquatic environment, you don't need to sail on the plumes that m normally normal milkweeds sail on. You don't need to have the coma, and there is no coma in here, just these large boat-like seeds that can float away and distribute the plant uh, whenever there's a flood. So that's an interesting variation of what most of the milkweeds do. But uh, to say that they all have fluff is not correct. This one doesn't. All right, when you're out there collecting seeds, you're going to run into these guys, as I've already pointed out. These are your large milkweed bugs, Oncopeltus fasciatus. Uh, it's a migratory species. It feeds on the pods and the seeds. Uh, there's no need to kill them or get rid of them. Uh, they're part of the environment here. Uh, and these are, these are all immatures here, but these things live in groups. Uh, they're kind of fun to watch, uh, but they're not fun if you get them in your seeds. So when you're bringing your bags of seeds in, be sure that these bugs are not in your bags of seeds because they will continue to feed on anything that you bring in. So uh, if you do see these out in the field, make sure they're not on the pods you collect or inside things that are partially open because they'll, they'll reproduce and uh, you can raise these things all winter on milkweed seeds, quite honestly. 
All right, another thing you're likely to encounter are the aphis nerii. Aphis nerii is also is known as the oleander aphid. The oleander aphid is a, a species that uh, is introduced, uh, reproduces part in a genetic, genetic, can't say that. Well, you know what I mean, live birth. And uh, this uh, aphid increases rapidly, and yet it is not a problem on a seed for seed harvest. It, Harvest and generally is not a problem for milkweeds except when you're growing really young plants. All right, let's talk about sorting the seeds from the coma or fluff. Uh, the simplest way, if you're only collecting a few pods, is to get a paper bag. Uh, throw your mature pods in a paper bag when you're collecting them out in the field. Bring them in, and then when the pods are open, uh, strip the contents of the pods into another paper bag. Uh, just with your thumb and fingers, just uh, slip them into another bag. And then uh, put uh, something modestly heavy in there, a marble or something in the bag. Uh, shake the bag a, a number of times to break the connections between the fluff and the seeds. And then it's really simple. You just take a scissors and cut off one corner of the bag and drain out the seeds, and the, pluff, the fluff tends to stay behind. Not completely, but most of it will. It depends on how big the hole is that you cut. In any case, that's the simplest way to harvest a small number of seeds. Just a couple of paper bags, something, a couple of pebbles or something in there. Actually, I wouldn't use pebbles for a couple of reasons, one of which is that they might be a little hard, but you don't want to introduce any fungus into that bag or make any, any fungus having any contact with the seeds. And we'll go on to why uh, in, in, in a few minutes. Never let your seeds touch the ground. That's the lesson here. All right, then we can go into a, a seed sorter. At, at Monarch Watch, we developed a seed sorter. It's kind of a fun thing. You can use shop vacs, or you can use a trimmer in a barrel. I'll show you a picture of that. And you can go to our website and see a lot more. You can just visit Monarch Watch again, uh, go to Bring Back the Monarchs, and go to our seed separator, and you'll find uh, more details. And if you want to design one of those things, we have the description there about how you can put one of those together. All right, this is our seed sorter. Um, I, I had some fun with this. I had uh, a couple of students. I had a, a male student who was an engineer and a female student who was an architect. And I uh, said, well, uh, we need to uh, come up with a seed sorter, and I need to have you guys put your heads together because uh, I'm not, I was in Alaska at the time that I made the call to him, and I said, you guys have got to figure this out, and then figure out how to how to sort all of this out and uh, make make something that looks like a butter churn. That's what my instructors were. Figure out something that looks like a butter churn that would turn and rotate, and then we can sort of suck the fluff off of it, right? So this is what they came up with, something that looks like a medieval torture device with lots of big screws in it. This spins around in the bottom. This, this, sits, this, this doesn't spin. This other part that's got the um, PVC pipe in it spins in that. Um, barrel there in the in the uh, um, in the trash can. So these are the two parts that fit inside the trash can, and you can see that those kind of rip the uh, the fluff away from the seeds. The seeds fall through the screen down to the bottom, and we can harvest the seeds. Now they're not entirely clean, but what we're doing is drawing off the fluff in that shop vac, and this is what happens. This is what it looks like when you have uh, pulled all that fluff out, and if you can clean it up a little bit more, you can stuff a pillow with it. And people do that. All right, so um, I like to fool around with this and make make it look like my beard's a little bit bigger. All right. Anyway, here's here's an even funner way to do this, but I wouldn't recommend. Don't do this at home. This is Elliot Demmer, and he he got a little impatient with this whole idea of using my seed sorter. So he took his uh, grass trimmer, he took his grass trimmer, and he put all of his stripped seeds into uh, this barrel, and then he turned on the trimmer, and I'd like to show you what uh, happens next, but he filled the neighborhood full of floss. I mean, it was just a cloud of floss coming out of this thing, and uh, it was <laughs> it was pretty it was pretty amazing. Actually, kind of amusing to watch this, but I wouldn't want to be standing downwind of this. Believe me, you'd just be covered with fluff. Uh, what you want uh, when you finish all of this is uh, seeds that look like this. This is the Asclepias viridis, the green antelope horn seeds. These are really nicely clean seeds. 
if you look at those seeds, if you pinch those seeds, you can determine which ones are, are viable which, uh, as opposed to which ones uh, do not contain cotyledons or developing um, um, leaf material in there. Uh, if the seeds have not filled out, if you rip them open, uh, it won't be white inside. If you took these seeds, put them between your fingers, and kind of made a, a little twist, uh, then you would be able to uh, see white material inside of the seed is, is uh, rich with um, uh, cotyledons that could germinate. Or uh, if it is just empty, it's flat, it's hollow, uh, you could tell that uh, quickly. There are ways of, of massively uh, determining uh, percentage of live seeds in batches like this. We generally don't do this. If you collect them at the right time, you store them in the right way, you'll get 60, 70, 80, 90 percent germination if you've done a really good job with this. All right, that shows a, a bunch of seed that's harvested, 1.18 pounds of, of various seeds. Now you've got to figure out how to store it. And one of the things that you really need to do um, right away with seeds like that is that you need to make sure they're dry. Now one of the ways we keep our program going is to solicit seeds from all over the country and we have received this past year probably uh, 200 different donations from for different parts of the country. People who have collected seeds, really good seeds, uh, packaged them up properly, labeled them properly, sent them to us and then we process them further and then we store them and then when we want to grow out uh, plants for, say, uh, 251, which would be in the center of the country, which would include parts of uh, Minnesota and Missouri and Kansas, and uh, uh, we would uh, take those seeds out and say, we need, uh, need 10,000 plugs for that area. Uh, how many seeds do we need? And it's usually pick out uh, something like four times as many seeds as we anticipate needing plugs. And the reason for that is that there is a potential, some, some potential die-off. Uh, there are some losses here and there in the, in the development of these, of these plants. Uh, so uh, generally the rule is that most milkweeds have about 4,000 seeds per ounce. So if we wanted to have 1,000 plugs, we would uh, give the nurserymen about an ounce of seed. Uh, that generally works out pretty well. Um, it usually is the case that the nurseries are able to generate, germinate at least 50% of the seeds, uh, at least, and often it's uh, 70, 80, 90%. In any case, if, you're, if the nursery works well, if the seeds are good, uh, you usually have a bounty rather than a deficiency, and that's what you always want to plan for. You want to plan for a bounty rather than any sort of deficiency. Anyway, we use this ecoregion map uh, to code all the seeds that come in, and then we grow the plants for those particular regions and send them back to those regions. All right, storing seeds. Let's get into that. Seeds must be dry. I can't emphasize this enough. You need to spread them out and keep, make sure they are dry before you put them in any sort of a container. And then you want to store them at about 40, 42 degrees Fahrenheit. And you want to keep the relative humidity as low as possible. 50 is pretty high. Uh, probably want to keep them down in the 40 to even 20 level, and the seeds will last a lot longer. And anything that you put into storage, you've got to properly label. You can't try to um, rely on your memory. Memories aren't any good. We know that. We, we think we have good memories, but we really don't for details like this. You want to label the things, the species, the source, the date, uh, anything that uh, is appropriate that will give you a handle on, on any special needs that these uh, seeds have or any special uses that you might plan for them. All right, this is how we store our seeds. We use a lot of different kinds of containers, but you can see that we've got an ID here. Uh, we've got the uh, time of collection. We've got the ecoregion indicated there. Uh, we've got the, the uh, location. Uh, we've got the collector there. So if you look at this, we have a code for each species. Uh, the first one on the left in the big jar is Syriaca. Then the tall one in the clear container is Syriaca again. Then we have Incarnata below that. And uh, then we have that small one that has Incarnata uh, from up north someplace in 222. And uh, then we have from John Barr, we have Asclepius Aspirula uh, collected in 2010 in Texas. Now that seed from 2010 is still good. Uh, we've been, been able to germinate milkweed seed that's as much as 15 years old. So uh, seed will last a long time if you take really good care of it. 
But that means it's got to be dry. It means that you've got to store it under the right conditions, uh, keep the humidity low, uh, keep it cool so that uh, you're, you're not losing the viability of that seed. All right, let's talk about stratification because this is something that probably limits uh, the use of all those seed packs that everybody's distributing. We've got a lot of people giving away seed packs. I mean, I've heard people talk about giving away a million seed packs with um, uh, Sclepius uh, Syriaca seeds in it. And the problem with that is unless the seeds have already been stratified, uh, most of those will not be usable or be effective because people will not stratify them. What do you need for stratification? Well, you need seeds and you need vermiculite. Vermiculite's a mineral. It's sterile. That's why you use vermiculite. Don't use sand. Don't use uh, potting soil. Don't use anything but something that is sterile. So vermiculite's sterile. And then you add water to the vermiculite so that the vermiculite is saturated with water but not uh, so that you have running water in there. Then add your seeds. Then label it. Uh, get your species, your source, your date on there. And again, store at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or 42 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 days. Now, you probably don't need 30 days, but it's probably pretty close. And it's safer to use 30 days than not. So 30 days in your refrigerator is all that you need. And your package is going to, your whole process is going to look like this. You've got the seeds there to the left. You've got your vermiculite to the right. You've got your water. And uh, you can see that's the kind of vermiculite you want. You want the really fine-grained vermiculite because you're going to be spreading it out later. So uh, that's, those are the ingredients. That's how you do it. And you put it together, and it looks like this in your baggie. Throw that in your refrigerator for 30 days. Put a date on it for when you threw it in, 20th of March, 20th of April, you take it out. And when you take it out, you spread it out. You spread those stratified seeds and vermiculite over a seed flat. Now, a seed flat is only about, oh, maybe an inch and three quarters to two inches deep. And you've got sterile soil in the bottom of that uh, seed flat. And then you're spreading the, the vermiculite with the seeds over the top of that. And then you cover that with about a quarter inch of vermiculite. And then you water gently, very, very, very gently. I mean, you use something, it's not a mister, but just a little heavier than a mister. Uh, you you um, keep that thing really moist, and you're going to have to keep it moist, um, but not saturated for days and days and days. And you want to be very careful when you first apply the water because if you apply the water too hard, your seeds and vermiculite is going to fly all over the place. So you wet it down very gently, and then you kind of you kind of soak it, but you don't saturate it. If you can get the, the meaning, you want it to be. Uh, you want it to really be thoroughly damp and stay damp because you want to keep those seeds uh, hydrated uh, so that they will uh, germinate with proper temperatures. So you want to maintain them at uh, moderate temperatures. I'm talking about 65 to 75 temper uh, Fahrenheit during the daytime. Uh, those temperatures are, are usually uh, favorable for uh, germination. Your greenhouse or facility can drop down to 55 at night. But you want those daytime temperatures and the sun to hit these things so that they're, you're, you're in the, the kind of the mid-70s at the max. Maybe you could hit 80 a day or two, but you, you don't want to really get super hot uh, surface temperatures there. they will dry out too fast. Your germination generally begins in uh, t uh, 7 to 10 days. And as you get the germination, the first thing that you're going to get uh, is you're going to get cotyledons coming up. I'll show you a picture of those. Uh, what you're looking at here are seed flats that have all been prepared. These, uh, these flats uh, are in the AES greenhouse uh, near us, Baldwin, Kansas. A lot of those are probably milkweeds. Uh, there is probably enough seed in there for a half a million plants in all of those flats. Each flat would probably contain somewhere around 2,000 seeds, uh, maybe a half ounce of milkweed seeds. And uh, then when they germinate, uh, they will all come up and you let them come up for about two weeks, and then you start uh, transplanting them. So this is what happens when you have common milkweed uh, coming up in one of those plants. You can see all of those little white lines there. Uh, those are radicals coming out of the seeds. The radical is the, you know, the first root that comes out, and that root comes out and digs into the digs into the soil. The seed then becomes erect, and then the seed itself splits, and the two. Uh, first leaves, they're not really first leaves, the cotyledons come out, 
and you can see the cotyledons. This is Asclepius viridis again, and th these are just cotyledons. They've kind of shed their seed coat. The radicals have already dug in, and these are developing, and these, these are probably on the order of five or six days old at this point. When you get them up to about uh, 10 days, they'll look like this. This is the first uh, set of leaves on Asclepius erratica, the common milkweed. Uh, and this is really good, and this is what you want. You want a thick patch like this, um, and they will grow nicely if you have good greenhouse conditions, good sterile soil that they're growing in, uh, no problems with fungi and so on and so forth. You'll get flats that look like this, and each flat will contain about 2,000 seedlings. All right, let's go to transplanting. So after the appearance of the second pair of true leaves is probably the safest time to uh, begin transplanting. Again, you want to use sterile potting soil, and you want to have clean hands and tools. And the reason is that there are fungi everywhere. There are fungal spores everywhere, and this is why it's really important to use sterile vermiculite. It's important to use sterile potting soil, and you want to use sterile implements when you're uh, starting to plant these seeds. So you want your hands clean. Not, you don't, don't go out there and play in the dirt and then start uh, transplanting plants. That's not the way to do it. Uh, you want clean tools, and those tools can be either a stick or it can be a pen or something like that. But it should not, whatever you use, should not have been in contact with any dirt. So you separate the seedlings carefully. You can do this by uh, just shaking off the dirt, or sometimes you, if they're really grown together, you use a little water so that you can loosen things up, wash the dirt away, separate the seedlings careful. carefully. You dig a hole in the flat. You put the uh, seedling in that hole with the roots uh, so that they are uh, expanded. You don't want to compress the roots too much. Uh, and you want to compress the soil very gently around the roots. You don't want to push the soil down really uh, strongly around the roots because you want those roots to be able to expand into the uh, surrounding uh, potting soil. Uh, if you compress this stuff too much, they just won't be able to do that. The depth of the stem should be about the same or a little bit lower uh, than it would be in a germination flat. The higher you are on the stem with your soil, the more resistant that stem is going to be to fungi. So you could plant them just a little bit deeper, but um, you certainly don't want to plant them shallower because that makes them a little bit more uh, vulnerable to fungi. And just to be safe and to make it easier on yourself in the long run so you don't have to replace a lot of plugs that haven't had seedlings develop, you put two seedlings per cell. And, uh, that generally works out pretty well because you have about 10% loss uh, when you're doing this, uh, if, you're, if you're doing it right. If you're doing it poorly, you're going to have more than 10% loss. All right, this is a, a group of folks we had in from Oklahoma last uh, weekend, and these are flats of Asclepius incarnata seedlings, and uh, Natasha here on the left is teaching them how to uh, do the planting in these 32 cell trays. And you can see those sticks in the cup behind, those are their uh, sticks that they use to poke the holes in the, in the potting soil. You can use a finger, you can use a pen. Fingers are probably a little too big. Uh, those those uh, dibble sticks uh, work pretty well, or a pen works pretty well. It shows another picture of the same, same thing. And here you can see what the roots look like. This is a very fibrous root on the swamp milkweed. Uh, many of the others will have a more tuberous root. Uh, but this will give you an idea, and you don't want to take all those roots and compress them too much, right? Um, so you want to have those roots kind of uh, open. You want the hole big enough to accept those roots. You don't want to pack them all together too tightly. But uh, at the same time, um, you, know, you, you don't have a, a complete choice on this. You're putting them in a hole. You're going to compress a little bit, but try not to compress it too much, um, especially with something like a fibrous root mass like this. Uh, this is one uh, completed uh, one of those 32 plug trays, and uh, uh, then you can put that down uh, uh, either on a bench or on the on the floor. We put them in a, we were putting them on the floor of the greenhouse the other day because we didn't have enough benches, and uh, then to water them in because that potting soil that you're putting them in is uh, is not uh, is not rich with water, so you need to water them in. And look at how this hose is being used. Natasha's using this hose. Uh, to very, very gently water these in. And so you've just got a kind of light rain on them. You do it for enough minutes so that uh, they are soaked through. You 
got to be careful so that the plants are not touching the plastic or they won't stand up afterwards. So if you look at all these plants in the foreground here, a lot of them are kind of bent over. But 24 hours later, if they're not touching the plastic, they'll kind of all stand upright. And you'll know that you've done a good job of transplanting those things, that the roots are taking up the moisture and the nutrients, and you're ready to go. All right, this is a nursery that we're working with down in Ada, Oklahoma. Uh, we've got people down there. This is uh, all these trays have been planted uh, that you see here, and there's still some more being planted. There's, at the time this picture was taken, over 32,000 uh, plugs were represented in, these, in this particular uh, greenhouse, and they're growing about 50,000 plugs for us for Oklahoma and Texas this year. Uh, this is what those plugs looked like about 10 days ago. All right, damping off. Damping off, wow, that's something we have to really be careful of. Now, I've harped a number of times about uh, being sterile and being careful not to get any sort of soil contaminants into what you're doing. Don't contaminate the seeds. Don't contaminate uh, the soil that you're working with. Don't contaminate your, uh, your, your, your implements. Uh, don't contaminate your hands while you're planting these things. You've got to uh, keep it clean, and the reason for that is that you've got at least four genera of fungi out there, the principal one being Pythium, the first one that's listed, that is pretty tough on a lot of these plants. And uh, you um, will get damping off if you don't do that, and this shows a lot of damping off. These bare spots that you see in these flats here have been attacked by Pythium in particular. Uh, this is called damping off. The plants come up, they look good, and then they die back, and they create these holes in these flats. Um, Greenhouses can lose hundreds of thousands of plants at the seedling stage uh, if you get this thing really going. And you've got to be careful not to um, introduce this into whatever rearing operation you've got, whatever growing operation you've got, because it's a, it's a devil to get rid of. Uh, there are some ways of, of handling this, and they're pretty technical, but they're not very satisfactory. And once it gets into a greenhouse, it's like any of these other uh, organisms that have spores. They're pretty hard to clean up. All right, uh, when all things go well, this is what you're looking at uh, in one of these greenhouses. This is about 45,000 uh, plugs of, or seedlings of common milkweed that are re re uh, ready to uh, transplant. They're probably all being transplanted uh, this week. Um, 45,000, that looks pretty good, and that's a lot of work to transplant all those. You need an army. Uh, this shows a mixed group of milkweeds right there in the foreground. You've got Perennis. Uh, you over the one that's just a little bit uh, to the left, uh, right of that, the one that kind of looks like a rug, uh, that's all tuberosa, and then you've got a lot of other species in there, including Virgus and a number of others. Uh, this, you're probably looking at another 80,000 seedlings there. This is what's going on in, in Elliot's greenhouse right now. All right, let's talk about growing out transplants. Um, you need to grow the plants, uh, transplants out for four to or for six to 10 weeks, depending on your conditions in your greenhouse, content, depending upon you know, how cloudy or how cool it is outside. Um, you know, here we're kind of at the, the mercy of the, of the conditions. Uh, we sometimes can have a cloudy week here and that'll slow things down, but uh, six to 10 weeks will get these things to root out well, and the roots need to be well formed prior to planting or shipment. Uh, very often, if they grow really well, you, you can cut back the foliage and cutting back can create more stems, or we call them uh, ramets. And that's, that's very often very beneficial because what you're doing is you're not only forcing them to produce more ramets, but they're producing more uh, roots as well and getting them really well rooted. So this is what they should look like when they leave the greenhouse. Uh, this is Incarnata, a very fibrous root system over here to the left, tuberosa in the center, and you can see these kind of tuberous roots that are coming out of it. And you can't see it over there uh, on the uh, Viridus, but uh, right by Elliot's hand, by his two middle fingers there, you see this kind of pale uh, object there that looks a little like his finger color. That's actually a tuber right there uh, from uh, Viridus. And the Viridus has these uh, real tuberous uh, sorts of roots, and uh, you really want those to develop as well as you possibly can before you put those things in the ground. Now this shows plants that just as we're, they're ready to ship, these were growing these 32 uh, plug flats, and uh, they're, they're pretty much ready to go. And uh, uh, you see Viridus over there on the 
on the left, it's a smaller plant when it's shipped. Uh, Solavantii has been cut back a couple times. It's got several different ramets coming out of it. Soraka has really got a, <laughs> it's a, got a bunch of, of, of ramets coming up because of the way that was uh, managed. And then you've got Incarnata, which has not been trimmed back, which is over there on the right. But generally, it's Incarnata that is, is, has to be trimmed back the most because that's the most vigorous plant uh, in terms of greenhouse growth. All right, we're getting to closer to the end here. Now uh, we've got Elliot uh, uh, proudly displaying some of his Encarnata, and uh, he's, he's probably about ready or probably did take his hedge trimmer to those and trim those back to about four inches high before they were shipped. Uh, this is what they generally look like in his greenhouse, and that's generally what they look like when they're starting to, to ship them out. We, we put them into uh, sleeves of netting so that when UPS throws them around, they don't all pop out of the pots, but they tend to do that anyway because UPS tends to not know what up and down is. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's neither here nor there. You see the arrows show up where up and down is, but that's not always where the, the way the boxes are handled. Anyway, you see here single flat boxes, double flat boxes, a pallet of boxes. These things go out as 32s. Uh, 64s, uh, and even in thousands. Uh, in that pallet probably contains tw uh, 1,200 plants. All right, planting, uh, I'm not going to have time to go into all the detail. There's a lot of things that we can talk about in terms of site preparation. Uh, what you can do is you can throw out rugs, you can throw out cardboard, you can throw out black plastic, you can kill all of the things that you need to kill under those things, and then after 10 days, two weeks, three weeks, uh, you can take those off, all the plants, or most of them are dead underneath. Or you can use the dreaded glyphosate two or three times to clear off a patch before you're going to plant it. There are two times to plant milkweeds in these native plants each year. You can plant them in the spring, or you can plant them in the fall. And uh, we've had very good luck with fall planting of these, these milkweeds. Mulching, there are lots of uh, alternatives here. Uh, we prefer to use uh, straw mulch. It's a more... A typical thing for these uh, native plants to be growing amongst match uh, native vegetation. And once you uh, get them in the ground, you want to water them about after they've been planted. And um, there are other things to talk about. We're not going to be able to talk about them now because uh, we're running out of time. But uh, you might want to be talking about soil augmentation in some cases. You might want to be talking about uh, of water. Um, having your water tested for the right pH and so on and so forth. So there are a number of other things, but that's probably for another uh, webinar. In any case, we plant these things as a potato plant, but plant them in straw if you possibly can. That's usually the best way to do it. Uh, if you're going to plant a lot of plants, uh, you might think about renting or buying a, uh, a, uh, a, a drill bed auger that uh, will get drill holes really fast. Uh, these things are very handy if you're putting a thousand uh, lastly, to t you know, what we're really talking about is restoring habitat, and the reason we're restoring habitat is that you know we're getting dealing with a lot of climate change uh, coming up here pretty fast. Uh, droughts are going to be in our future, uh, and it's the native plants that have these really deep roots that are really most effective in resisting drought. Milkweeds are very drought resistant generally uh, because they are deep rooted as well. Most of them are anyway. And so this is the kind of thing we need to be thinking about the future. So in addition to getting these milkweeds in the ground, we also have to be talking at some point in the future about all of the native plants that we want to plant among these milkweeds to create a more natural habitat for monarch butterflies and pollinators. All right, with that, that's all I have from Kansas. That's all that Toto and I have from Kansas anyway. And I want to thank you all for attending, and uh, I appreciate your, uh, your thoughts on this. If you've got any questions, I'll be... Glad to answer. I guess we got about 11, 12 minutes to go. And uh, you can always send us emails here at uh, Monarch Watch. We're kind of flooded with emails a lot of the time, so be patient. It might take us a while to get back to you. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Chip. That was, that was great. Um, and before we get to the questions, Cor and I have been tracking them, but before we get to those, we just wanted to thank everybody for taking the time to be with us today, and to you, Chip, for, for sharing this expertise about milkweed propagation. Um, I have a few housekeeping announcements for anyone that has to leave on time or early in case we go a few minutes over, but we, we do record these webinars, and they'll be available on both the, the NCTC and the Monarch Joint Venture website in, in the future. 
we'll follow up with uh, um, the short survey extra links that that we talked about in the chat during um, the course of the presentation and just with any more information about today's webinar we, we will follow up by email within the next week or so um, so feel free to, to step out whenever you need to otherwise we'll transition to a short question and answer period for about the next 10 minutes um, so with that tip I'm going to go through a few of these questions that we've pulled out but my first question for you is is not a question, more of a, a thing for you to comment on. Do you have tips for finding locally sourced milkweed seeds? So people interested in local ecotype, how might they best go about finding those milkweed? Uh, the Xerces Society uh, has a very nice uh, website uh, component, which is called Seed Finder. And uh, we have, you know, they, they've got the seed finder. We've got the plant finder sort of thing on our website, but they have the seed finder thing. So if you're looking for seeds of local milkweeds, go to the Xerces website and look at their seed finder uh, for milkweed seeds. That, that, uh, that's what we're referring everybody to. I agree. I refer people there quite often. Um, then to, to expand on the, your milkweed market program, could you maybe just talk people through the process and timeline for how they they might go about ordering plugs from from the milkweed market. Yeah, and go to the milkweed market. Uh, determine what your uh, what your location is and what your uh, eco region is, and then uh, communicate what you would like to have. We do have some uh, free milkweed programs that are being financed by um, uh, NRDC and Monsanto, but I think those are oversubscribed already. And I think what we probably have left now are milkweeds that are for sale. Um, uh, on the basis of uh, a cost per flat, and the flats are generally uh, flats of 32, although we do have some flats of 50 uh, that will be going out of the Oklahoma nursery. But anyway, just communicate through the website, through the milkweed market uh, to Angie. I talked to Angie this morning. She's only about 300 emails behind. So <laughs> be patient. Um, <laughs> that's how much interest there is. I mean, I've got two people working on this right now, but... Uh, we can't keep up with it. There's that much interest in milkweed. So, um, but be patient. We should be able to supply most people with milkweeds. And if we run out of milkweeds this spring, and we're hoping to clear out the, the greenhouse this spring out of at least 150,000 milkweeds out of uh, Elliott's nursery and, and more out of the other nurseries, uh, if we clean out those nurseries this spring and you still want milkweeds, we will grow another crop for fall. That's great. Um, there was a question or a series of questions on whether or not it was okay to leave the seeds in the pod for cold storage or over the winter. Um, so, so could you talk more about why it's important to remove the, the fluff before storing the seeds or stratifying them? Well, you, you, I mean, you could hang the bags up in your garage and let them over winter, but you're still going to have to stratify them. You still, you still need the moist, cold stratification. They can stay in the pods forever. Um, I've had stuff stay in the pods for 15 years and then taken them out and then cold stratified them and they came out fine. But you've got to cold stratify them. That's the, so it doesn't matter how long you keep them in the pods so much as uh, um, as, as uh, taking them and, and cold stratifying them. But the longer you leave them in the pods, and especially in an exposed place, the more likely insects or vermin are going to get into them and they are more likely to lose some vigor if they're exposed to really high temperatures. So, yeah, getting them out of the pods and putting them in a cold, dry storage is probably the best thing to do. And then cold stratification is still going to be needed. Sure. So stemming from what you just said, I'm going to skip a couple questions here. Um, in proper storage conditions, how long might you expect milkweed seeds to be, to, to remain viable in storage? Well, you know, viability is going to decline with time, but uh, I have successfully germinated things that are 17 years old in, in large quantities. So uh, I have no, and that was kind of a one-off sort of thing. So I don't know what's typical or what would happen over a lot of things. You know, generally, I suppose you probably want to give seeds, you know, no more than five or six years. Uh, um, I think it's probably unreasonable to expect really high viability after five or six years, even if you've stored them properly. Sure. And given the current 
condition and need for milkweed habitat, we don't recommend storing them for longer. We want all of that milkweed back out on the landscape. <laughs> yeah, so buy, buy milkweed so I can use a lot of this seed up. I've got three refrigerators full of seed, please. <laughs> Very good. Moving on, um, there were some numbers thrown around about how long the cold stratification process takes. Does this vary by species or region? And um, just as a related follow-up question, is it okay to leave seeds in the stratification process for longer than what's recommended? Oh, everything is possible, I guess. Uh, if you go further south, you probably don't have to stratify as much as you do further north. The further north you are, it, it would appear that the more stratification is needed. How long you can leave them in the cold, moist conditions, I don't know. I haven't uh, tried that, but I know that people have left them in the refrigerator with good intentions to take them out, but didn't, and you know they're still good a year later. So uh, I don't have, you know, the, I don't have experimental or quantitative data on any of those things, but I think the general rule should be that uh, more stratification is going to be needed in the north than in the south. Um, uh, there are probably a few things that. Uh, could be left in cold, moist conditions for a long time, but uh, I really don't have any data on those. Sure, and I guess what I what I use as my general rule of thumb is that the exposure to these cold, moist conditions are going to be imitating your your natural winter conditions as if they were outside. So yeah, um, and, and in fact, you can cold, uh, cold stratify them outside. I mean, so what you can do, and I've done it, is that you get a big flower pot. Uh, fill it with potting soil, and uh, then you uh, put uh, a quarter inch of, uh, of seeds on top of that, and then you put in a half inch of potting soil on top of that, put it outside for the winter, cover it with screen, put it on the north side of your house or something where it doesn't get a lot of direct sun in the wintertime, just let it sit outside in a moist condition all winter long, and that will give you good uh, cold stratification, and you take those seeds out in the spring and plant them, and they're, 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 they're terrific. So that's, a, that's an easy way to do it without uh, fussing with your refrigerator, but you're more likely to have damping off under those conditions because you're more likely to expose them to fungi. Great. Um, you were getting to this a little bit at the end, but you know there were a few questions about timing of planting, so, so maybe take a minute or two to, to expand on on more specifically on what timing considerations are for um, seeds and or plugs in the spring and fall. You know, what are the main considerations there for, um, you know, if you're going to plant plugs in the fall, is there some rule of thumb that, that people should be using for their region? Well, it's all latitude, isn't it? So if you are planting in the spring, uh, you might want plants as early as the end of March in Texas. Uh, maybe the middle of April in parts of Oklahoma. Uh, in Kansas, we don't really need plants here until maybe the 1st of May. And when you get up into Minnesota, you're probably not going to be wanting to put things in the ground until at least the 15th of May. So, the, you know, that's kind of the latitudinal gradient in the spring. You could talk about a similar latitudinal gradient in the fall. Uh, I, I would, if I were planting fall plants in Minnesota, I'd want to get them in the ground probably by the 1st of September. If I am planting fall plants here in Lawrence, Kansas, I'd probably want to uh, get them in the ground by the 1st of October. Uh, if I was going further south, uh, you, know, if it, you know, you can see I'm just repeating the reverse scenario here. Uh, you, part of what you do there depends upon uh, the temperatures, depends upon the moisture. Uh, whatever you do, you want to water them about three times after you put them in the ground. A lot of the things you're putting in the ground in the fall will not add new foliage before they go into winter. They just go into winter dormant, and then they come out in the spring. But if they are well planted, well watered, uh, well rooted when you put them in the ground, you should be able to get about 80% of those through to the next spring. So that's great. So in spring, the main consideration is to plant after the risk of frost. Right. So it's and, after and after in the fall, uh, getting them in the ground yeah, soon after enough the, before frost after that they have a little bit of a chance. Yeah, a week after first frost is generally the rule uh, for most of these okay. things. Or I should say a week after last frost in the spring. Sorry. Great. Um, well, it is 2 o'clock, but I'm going to leave with one more question. Um, obviously, there are, are pros and cons to using plugs 
and speed. Um, so, so maybe talk about the differences in, in transplanting plugs into the wild versus sowing seeds directly into the wild. Is there um, the difference in success rate or, or just whatever you have in terms of pros and cons for plugs well, versus that, seeds? I mean, for me, that's easy. I mean, I go with plugs all the time. And the reason for that is that you, you want some sort of measure of success, and you can get a good measure of success with plugs if they're handled pro properly you, and, uh, and you've pr properly prepared the beds and properly mulched them and probably properly watered them, you will, you will have success. If you put seeds in the ground, uh, you're probably not going to water them after you've put them in the ground and you are at the mercy of nature. And I have spent $1,000 to reseed an acre and gotten nothing for it. So um, I think a lot of others have had the same experience. You don't have the rainfall at the right time, nothing develops. And uh, the, the rodents of the fungi or the birds uh, are feasting on your seed. So uh, the, the seed uh, propagation uh, or the propagation of seeds for uh, seedling establishment through uh, 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 seeding rates, uh, that's, that's good. It has to be done. Um, that's ultimately what's going to restore millions and millions of acres. But we don't have the seed for that right now. And if you're looking for instant success, go with plugs uh, because they're more guaranteed to give you instant success. Um, but ultimately, I mean, I really have nothing against seeding, except that it's a higher risk. Very good. Well, thank you again, Chip, and, and thanks to the 450 or so people that were watching the webinar, at least that I could, could watch or that I saw online. So um, with that, I'm going to wrap things up. Thanks again. You will hear from us with a follow-up email. And, and feel free to reach out to Chip and us at the Monarch Joint Venture um, or any of our partners for that matter with, for more information. So we look forward to our next webinar next month, which we'll also distribute more information about. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>